Hello, what's up, TDF fans? Um, I'm Matt Doyle. And I'm Itai Benson. Uh, and we play Jamie and Paul. They're a longtime couple engaged to be married in company on Broadway. And uh, yeah, what are we here to chat about? We're here to chat about <laughs> our show, our pandemic life, and how much we miss each other. <laughs> yes, and this wonderful gender-swapped revival uh, of Stephen Sondheim's landmark musical and George Firth's landmark musical. And uh, yeah, and just to talk to each other and say hi and <laughs> and, and reconnect. We do text a lot, you guys, but it's rare that Atai and I like sit down and, and get to... Uh, get to do this. It's been a while, buddy. I miss you so much. Yes. And thanks to TDF for having us. This is truly a nice treat during these insane times. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh man. So we have questions, right? Let's, uh, let's get to that. I mean, let's just, yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. What attracted you to this particular take on company and had you seen the London production? Itai, have you? Um, I didn't see the London production, but I certainly heard a lot about it. Um, you know, you hear a lot about revivals that are doing kind of crazy things with uh, uh, revising the original writing or production in some way. And often I, I you know, often that can be a little eye rolly for me. I'm like, okay, now they're doing some crazy concept with this show. But when I heard about this one, um, first of all, I'm such a fan of our director, Marianne Elliott, and I've seen everything she's done that came to the States. And, um, but when I heard that they were changing Bobby into a woman, mm. um, that immediately struck me as a, a smart and right choice for today. Um, so I, I just wanted to be part of that. First of all, just to be part of a Stephen Sondheim Broadway production <laughs> at all is like my, my high school dream come true. But then to be a part of such a radical shift in company and to truly make a company for today, um, that was very exciting. Mm -hmm. I always say that um, in this business, it's always the shows that you don't really have on your radar that you end up involved with. At least that's been my experience. Like the shows that I usually like want to be a part of and go mm -hmm. after like full force are the ones that like I didn't even get a call back for. Um, <laughs> but I had heard about this production and I thought it was brilliant and genius immediately. Um, you know, I had worked with Marianne Elliott on War Horse and we were very close during that process. So I was so excited that she was working on a musical because I think she's so unbelievably brilliant as is the uh, lead producer on our show, Chris Harper. And I was so excited for them. And, but I never thought like, oh, that's something I definitely like will be a part of. And yeah. they started auditioning here and I wasn't really called in for the first calls. So I was like, well, okay, maybe, maybe she'll call me in eventually. And, and finally I got to go in and read for them. And it was, uh, it was just so incredible to see the like brilliant work that Marianne had done on the show already, just by the simplest changes, you know, like yeah. making Bobby a female just elevates this piece into the, the time that we're living in, in a way that is so easy and you barely have to change any text whatsoever. Yeah. And that's what was so remarkable about this change and makes it feel so smart. It's not a change where you're really like taking apart the material and really like starting to maybe destroy it for our Sondheim uh, purists, but <laughs> it really feels just like the easiest, easiest change. And it's still company. It's still the show that you love, but in a very, very modern perspective from the perspective of a, a, of a woman. And that was so exciting and then of course to get to play a gay man um in a sondheim show and work with steven sondheim and work with you a tie i come on it was just uh absolutely probably the most and is the most exciting thing i've ever been involved in yeah and those changes for our roles in particular for those who don't know company that well uh, matt's character jamie is usually amy a lot yes. of the a lot of the supporting roles are gender swapped as well and this you know, I keep talking about how in 1970, when the show, when the show first opened on Broadway, having Amy, uh, Jamie and Paul on stage would have been science fiction. It would have been Absolutely. considered fantasy, you know, and now it's so normal. Yeah. And we really didn't have to, like, none of the text has really changed in our scene, um, but it just hits in a different way, in a really, really, I think, a very powerful way to see two two men about to get married and it's so it's so normal but they're 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 dealing with the same issues right before a marriage as as any couple would absolutely and, um 
it's beautiful to be part of that. That feels like a very landmark moment for this show. Right. It's incredible to be able to not only deliver the message that this is such a universal thing and universal experience for all of us, love, relationships, that how complicated, how frightening, how joyful, how terrible they can be. <laughs> um, but it's also amazing to, in this era, you know, and obviously in the time that this show first came out, a gay marriage was not on the roster, not even close, not even within the realm of possibilities. And so it's amazing now that we have this right that we will hopefully hang on to is uh, it, the question arises like just because we can doesn't mean we should. And that is yeah. the that's one of the only added pieces of text in our show that was obviously very much approved by Sondheim to really just examine this, examine this with gay men because we have this right now, but do we like it because we can do we do does that mean that we run to the altar and that being a part of jamie's fears and uh anxieties is a very very real and very contemporary thing and something i'm really proud to bring to the stage yeah yeah next <laughs> question <laughs> oh house yes it did in our in our week and a half run okay yeah our- it says getting married today brought down the house nightly did you expect it to get such a big reaction Oh boy, I hoped. (laughs) I had heard that it went over very, very well in London. And I, you know, I felt like every single performance that we had, we only had nine of them, was a new discovery. And in terms of making it uh, land more and more and discovering more of the comedy and discovering more of the honesty. And that's what you get in previews. But when you have a piece that is that complicated, the first time you're shot out of the canon, it's like, I have no idea how this is going to go. And for anyone that saw the first preview, <laughs> I can't wait for you to come back. <laughs> I was very proud of it then. But um, I will say that like that first moment, it was actually our dress rehearsal, which was only like half full house. Um, when we when I first dropped to my knees at the end of it, I was terrified. I was like, this either went well, or it's going to be like, yay. <laughs> and then yeah. just this like wall of sound hit me and hit us. Yeah. And I remember thinking, oh my God, thank God. <laughs> like, thank you. Thank you, Lord. I am so grateful that that went well. And, uh, and it's Marianne's brilliant direction as well. I mean, the staging of this number is just outrageous and it's the most clever staging that this number has ever had yeah and um yeah that's what's so extraordinary about this about this production is that not only it takes it the staging just supports your incredible performance but i i'm the first character who speaks right after that applause and you know (laughs) i didn't know what to expect either but i did not quite realize that i would have to wait like a full minute (laughs) before I could talk of just everyone cheering. And it's just, there's so much coming together in this number. It's a, it's obviously a very favorite number from the show. So people are anticipating it. People are excited about it. Then uh, you are delivering such a, I think such a simple and truthful way of doing it that the comedy lands because the comedy is in the song and because you're just truthful to to the anxiety of the moment, which I know you have a little bit of experience with. Um, (laughs) So you're drawing from truth and you're drawing from reality and it lands so well. And then it's supported by this unbelievable staging, which I don't really want to give away. No, I know. uh, Because it's so surprising and so exciting that all of those, it's pure, this song is a moment of pure theater in our production because it's every element coming together. It's lighting and stagecraft and acting and music. And I think it's just overwhelming for an audience. Yeah. So it's like they have no choice but to scream. But to like, and, you yeah! know, <laughs> that applause felt like a visceral reaction yeah. to that yeah. number. And and I was just, I remember what, like sort of from the corner of my eye, seeing you like on your knees with that applause, just like bathing in it and basking in it. And I'm like, what a moment. Oh, yeah. I what mean, an it was incredible a, moment. Best moment of my like theatrical life so far and not just because of applause but because it was when you're doing a comedy first of all you use that preview process and I can't wait to get back to the material that's what's so exciting about it but when you're doing a comedy you're sitting in a room with people with comedians first of all um (laughs) that are know the material like don't like there's no real laughter in the room every now and then there's a couple laughs here and there, but like, you don't know, you don't know what's going to land until you have an audience and your audience is your, your like 
piece of the puzzle that is missing until that very, very first one. So to continue to solve it and to continue to have audiences again, like I, that, I can't wait. And it was such a wonderful moment because it was just this moment of like all of this work, deconstructing this song together and this scene yes. together and working on it with Marianne and making sure that we were truthful and simple and allowed the lyrics, these brilliant lyrics to speak for themselves and to trust that and not push it and to trust that that would work. I mean, it, I was mortified, but Marion was like, uh-uh, like n you cannot push this. The second that yeah. you're, you're getting eggy, I will, you know, I will make sure that that doesn't happen. And I trusted her and it yeah. worked because she's a genius, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you relate to the way your character look. Yes, characters look at relationships and commitment. You take this, Atai. Yes, well, <laughs> I think that, uh, I, I'd like to believe that we are both very well cast in these yes. roles. Um, Matt has heard me say this a thousand times. This I love is it. like my stump, my stump speech Can't about wait. how it feels that <laughs> in every relationship, there is uh, a gardener and a flower. And uh, you know, those roles can often shift and change, but um, you know, I think people are naturally inclined to be gardeners or flowers. People, some people who need a little more care and some people who are a little natural at caretaking. Uh, and that can often shift, but I think Paul, my character, is the ultimate gardener, and uh, Jamie is the ultimate flower, and they just fit perfectly that way. And I think I tend to play that role in my life. Um, yeah. And uh, it's it's just I think with Paul, um, with the role that I play, he maybe uh, gardens a little too much. <laughs> He's maybe a little smothering with uh, the care and, you know, the leaving of little notes for Jamie saying, I love you, you know, randomly throughout the day. I, I wouldn't say I go that far, but um, I do. Uh, his his unwavering love and support for Jamie um, and loving him, not in spite of his flaws, but because of them. That, I think, is, is something I, I really have tried to tap into with the role. It's that these things that make Jamie quote unquote crazy or anxious mm -hmm. or whatever. It's not a thing that, that Paul has to, has to get over or has to like right. accept and deal with. It's something that he actually loves Jamie for. Mm -hmm. He loves that he gets anxious. He loves that he freaks out before a big event. Um, and I think that's, that's really beautiful and something that I try to bring into my own relationship. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you said it already, but I'm definitely, uh, I'm definitely Jamie uh, through and through. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I've only become Jamie more over the years. I, I definitely am a bit of a caretaker myself. I mean, in the literal sense, like I'm the one that cleans, I'm the one that cooks, I'm the one that puts things together because I'm so anxious. You know, I'm, I'm, oh, to be lame as all hell. I'm, I'm Monica Geller. You know, I'm, I'm like high strung, and I'm putting things together. But Max, my partner, is the ultimate Paul. And it's so weird to be in that relationship and recognize that, especially after working on this piece. And we brought so much of ourselves to this piece, you and I, Atai. And I would go to work and I would just feel like I was in an extension of my own relationship at work, which is why we were able to have such quick chemistry with each other and really enjoy working with one another. Is we just, we recognized our partners in each other. And I think that was what really helped us out. Um, I recently, cause you know, like we're in quarantine with each other. And yeah. I mean, it is, ourselves times 10 lately um and max leaves notes like paul and he's been <laughs> doing that since before he even knew the scene um he did not know company very well and he didn't know that paul left notes and we were in rehearsals and he and he would start leaving notes for me before rehearsals like just wanted to let you know i love you and i was like is it does he know like that he's actually doing a joke in the show and uh nope. and he still does it all throughout quarantine and the other day i was like i'm having moments of course like we all are it's a difficult time yeah and i think i just like had a moment the other night and i could feel it there it was completely irrational but i'm like storming around the apartment i don't even know what triggered it something pissed me off you know and uh and I'm like, you know, slamming cabinets and I'm going to my bedroom and I sit down and start texting. And I just see Max in the other room and there's nothing. Like he's just <laughs> watching TV 
like totally unaffected by it. And I started laughing so hard and he like diffused me completely because I knew like, oh, you, you just, yep, this is what you live with. It doesn't matter. It's part of, it's somehow you've learned to love it. I'm, yep. thank you so much. <laughs> and I'm so sorry. <laughs> And I guarantee you the things that you think are difficult about yourself or whatever, um, he loves you for those reasons. <laughs> he better. <laughs> uh, he's, such, he's such a Paul. He's such a Paul. It's but, so true. Uh, you know, it's it's funny when I got this audition and I practiced with uh, my fiance, Alexandra. Mm -hmm. um, Yay! <laughs> Woo! He's I'll getting get to that. Uh, I've been thinking obviously a lot about this show because I'm, I myself am now thinking about getting married as I'm, you know, engaged and we're trying to plan basically a wedding for maybe 22, 2022, 2021. We don't know because no one knows anything, but no. um, it's given me more, it's given me more to think about with this show and, and what it means and um, what it means to be getting married. <laughs> the biggest thing that I say uh, like lately is when we come back to these roles and we will and and I'm very confident in that and I even at this point where things it seem even more up in the air and crazier than they did even just a few weeks ago because that's what we're living in I, I am very confident that that is a win and when we come back to these roles just talking to everyone and what we've experienced in this and lived through in the, through with this outrageous experience um I we're all in relationships and we're all going through things that I don't think we would have been forced to go through with our partners had we not gone through this absurd time. And I think when we come back to these roles, I can't wait to watch people elevate their performances even further after this time away from the material and coming back to it, learning what we've learned now um, about life and love and uh, just the complexities of, of our partners. And yes. I'm excited for that. I'm excited to uh, return to the material and Me reassess too. it. Yeah. And, and, and company, ultimately, I've been thinking about this during the pandemic, that so much of it is about self-isolation. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, what does it mean to, especially right now we're in quarantine and like, I try to think what, it, what would it have been like had I been alone right mm -hmm. now? Have oh, I not God. had Alexandra with me? And for some people, that's really what works. Some people yeah. have been together with, have been on lockdown with partners and are like, this is driving me insane. I need to be by myself. And I think that's just a whole new layer that's going to be added to our show post COVID. Oh, yeah. you know, that line and being alive, yeah. alone is alone, not alive. I mean, that's, that's going to read so, that's going to, be so different and land so differently. The very first number, being in a small space with all of those people singing company, I will be bawling my eyes out and I can't wait. I live for it. That's what yeah. that's what gets me through. I don't care when it happens. I don't care. I'm, yeah. We're doing it. <laughs> we will <laughs> <Yes>. be back. <laughs> Next question. Next question. <laughs> Did Sondheim attend any rehearsals? What was Woo! that like? Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, he did. Sondheim, uh, I don't know if you guys remember this because it seems like 20 years ago, but Sondheim had like a, a foot injury at the time. So he was off his feet at the start of rehearsals and wasn't there for our very first rehearsal, which was um, sad, but he came uh, so much and was there for um, so much of the process and, and gave his notes and gave his input and felt very present for this revival. He He's... I think a big fan of the piece. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he, um, you know, there have been a few text changes that he approves and he, yeah. you know, everything has to go through him. Every syllable has to go through him. Yes. Script included. And that's, what's beautiful is George Firth who wrote the book defer. He passed away some yeah. years ago, but didn't, didn't maintain like the book through his estate. He gave permission to Stephen Sondheim for this uh, uh, to approve any changes to this book. And I think that that shows what a collaboration and trust that they had. And um, yeah, um, I, the, one of the highlights that I can remember of the entire rehearsal process and probably of my whole theatrical life was the sits probe of company oh, with God. Um, the sits probe is the rehearsal that we sing the score with the orchestra for the first time. And Stephen Sondheim was in the room Listening filming us, us. <laughs> yes. and listening filming to us, us sing his music and his lyrics um 
and doing that in front of him and watching him smile and react and cry. He's a big crier. He's a big crier. Um, <laughs> big softy. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, was was so thrilling and was so beyond anything I imagined would would happen for me. And um, yeah. I hold, I still hold on to that. And uh, I can't wait for him to be there um, when we return. I know. It's amazing. I, one of the things that I have to say about Steven is, um, you know, I, I had the opportunity of working with him on the Sweeney Todd revival off Broadway too. And I'm wowed by his willingness to reinvent. Um, some people are so precious about their work and he he's, you know, precious about it, but in a very uh, intellectual and uh, open way like he if it makes sense he's going to take a risk and go with it if if it's something that excites him he's going to do it and i think that's so refreshing especially in a composer who is a legend to us and his i feel like the sondheim purists out there are more purists and protective over his work than he is i think he wants to continue to explore it because yeah. that's what theater is it's living and breathing and it has to have new life and he's so willing to go there and do that and that's why we've been given these incredible revivals of his work and they're adventurous and they they're creative and and they keep reinventing his work and nothing excites him more than that and that's that's just so amazing to be in that kind of a creative space with someone like him who is who's allowing for that i mean that's yeah don't he's, see one that our, a lot. he's one of our last links to the golden age of, oh yeah of broadway and the fact that he is willing to evolve and that he's 90 years old and still so sharp yeah the few conversations i've had with him he's oh yeah quick he is witty he is funny he is like he's still at the top of his game absolutely and, um uh, that's probably from doing all the puzzles and all the crosswords yes. <laughs> over so many decades. Um, uh, but he's, he's just, yeah, his willingness to adapt and to trust artists like Marianne Elliott with his work. Okay. He, he puts his full trust in her and to make such a radical change, like making Bobby into a woman, making Jamie and Paul a gay couple. He put his full trust in her and it has paid off. Absolutely. Yes. Next okay. question. Tell us your Ooh. best Patty story. Tell us your best Patty Lupone story. Go. Oh, there are uh, there are very so there many. Are many. There are many. Uh, um, I will say. I will say. You know, we obviously she has this like quote reputation for being a quote diva, which I think is just a word that was invented for women who spoke up for themselves exactly. <laughs> to exactly. their to their male directors. Yes. Um, so, but you know. She has this like, whatever, reputation. So you don't know what to expect in rehearsal. And I had never met her before. And I go in and she is so, she's so about the work and about the ensemble. And anytime she spoke up, she was right. And, and she's- Always right, she always is, right. And, but it's about, it's about the work. That's what I love. I remember early on in rehearsals, we are rehearsing the opening number in the little box. And, um, you know, it's a bunch of loud Broadway singers just like living for this Sondheim score. And we're, we're singing as loud as we can. Right. Cause it's um, week one too. So we're all trying to be like, <laughs> <laughs> we're all here. trying to impress. Yeah. And, and we're singing under, uh, Bobby Katrina's solo lines. Yes. And Patty stopped the rehearsal and she said, she said, guys, we can't all be singing at the top of our lungs or no one is going to hear our lead character. Mm -hmm. We need to all blend. We need to quiet down and give her space to deliver her words, to deliver mm -hmm. the story. The story yeah. is Bobby's story. And I remember thinking, wow, a quote diva would have said, everyone quiet so because I can't hear myself. I need right. to sing louder. Right. But it's she, not about, no, it's yeah, about the It wasn't about first. her. It was yeah. about Bobby needs to be heard because it's Bobby's story. And she's all about the story. She's all about the work. And, and I so admire that. She is old school in the best way. Me too. I, I can't possibly agree more. I love Patty so much. I love Patty's delivery. I love Patty's everything. I mean, she's she absolutely is someone that I thought I was going to get along with. Um, and and then I, I did, you know, like she just, even when she's 
harsh because she can be, of course. Like, yes, but it's not, it's she's right. <laughs> you know, so she'll stop the rehearsal sometimes and be like, what is happening? And you're like, thank you. Thank you for saying it. Yeah. I'm like, somebody yeah. needed to say it, you know? And Marianne said that to me too one day. You know, I, I was like, I think we brought that up. And and Marianne just said, Patty's always right. She's always right. She was like, she's always right. And I will always listen to her. Um, yeah. She's just so smart and she's so much about her company and the ensemble and she cares for us. And that was something that was really beautiful to see is how much she wanted to be a part of the company. She was shooting Hollywood when we first started. So she was flying back and forth and, you know, trying to be in the room with us and then trying to shoot a new episode of Hollywood and then she'd fly back. It was insane, her her schedule. And she, every time she came back, she was like, I just want to be here. Yeah. I want to be with my company. I want to be working with you guys and getting to know you. And that was so beautiful. Um, my favorite Patty story was day one because it was like, I was like, yes, I've got my first Patty moment because I, there was just like a bit of testing me in it. I was, <laughs> we were looking at the uh, staging for getting married today with the set and they were breaking it down and I was sitting next to Patty and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm sitting next to Patty and we're looking at our set. This is so crazy. Um, and they start explaining what happens in the staging of uh, getting married today. And Patty looks at me. And just completely like dead in the eye. We've not had a conversation really yet at this point. And she just goes, it's the funniest effing moment in the show and turns back. And I was like, oh, I was like, that's a test. And I take it. <laughs> I was like, you passed. Absolutely. You I passed. did. Well, and that was the thing is like, on, uh, Patty's got that, which I love because I'm like, yes, motivate me. Let's go. And then there's the other side of her, which was every single night after, uh, as the scrim would come down for Katrina singing, someone is waiting. I was sitting next to Patty on the um, the stoop of the, the building that's rolling back and the scrim would come down. And as soon as it hit the floor every night, even in our dress rehearsals, she just grabbed my knee and she said, go get it, kid. And I was just like, come on, you don't, I won't, not, I won't forget that for the rest of my life. Just every night, just go get him, kid. I was like, that's amazing. She's, she's amazing. She I love her. And she, she's, she's also a, she is a party woman. Oh, <laughs> she yes. loves to party. Come to my dressing room. Let's have drinks. Yes. She has all the snacks. All, all of the them. snacks. She's not, she's not one of those actors who will like sequester themselves and like shut their no. door. Um, her door is always open for anyone. She let me nap on her little, you know, couch thing, her chaise or whatever. <laughs> and um, <laughs> she's, <laughs> and, yeah. um she's, uh, she's just wonderful. And uh, also this is a moment that I won't necessarily give it away, but if you blink, you'll miss it. I do get to make out with Patty Lapone in the show. Yeah, and it's my dream does. come true. And yeah. I told, I told our director, and our producer, to mean me originally. <laughs> <laughs> I win. I told our director and our producer. I said, "Man, if you would have told me that from the beginning, I just would have done the show for free." So yeah, you really, <laughs> you really missed out. You really missed out on an opportunity. But yeah, oh my god, couldn't love her more. Couldn't love her more. Perfect. Yep. If you could play any other character in Company, who would it be? Hmm. 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 That's tough. That is tough. I, you know, I would probably want to play Theo if I could play another character. Um, that scene is written so beautifully. Theo, uh, who was originally Kathy, right? I'm not screwing that up. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Theo, uh, he, that scene is just magnificent. It's such a short little snippet in the midst of um, another hundred people. And it's Bobby realizing I think one of the most painful, painful truths about life, which is sometimes you miss out. And sometimes you do look back and there is somebody that you go, that could have, that, that could have been something. And it is just so well paced and beautifully delivered, by the way, by Kyle Dean Macy and Katrina Link in this show. But it's always text that I like every single time I sit down and I hear it, I'm like, what a like, what a perfect scene. Like George Firth, my God, it's just like, it's just simple and magnificent. And I think like, yeah, I love Theo. I know that's strange, but I do. Yeah, um, no, it's a, it is a beautiful scene. All these scenes are little perfect little snippets. Um, in our production, I would probably say David, 
because I am I am uh, a Christopher Fitzgerald groupie from way back. Yes. Um, yes. He is, I call him the patron saint of Bach. Uh, he's the first Bach, and then I got to play Bach later on. So I've always sort of followed his career and seen, seen him as someone of like a, an idol. And yeah. um, he's also just so unbelievably hilarious. And the scene, that's another scene, Jenny and David, that is gender swapped. Yeah. And works so perfectly in this, you know, David in this production is a stay at home dad who's kind of a square and getting stoned for the first time. And it's just, it's just like comic gold. It is. Uh, but with heart and with, you know, some pathos and tragedy in there too. So yeah. um, that's probably the other role I would play. Oh, I love that. I would love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it on zoom. Okay, great. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Company made a commitment to diversity when it reopens. Whether what other changes would you like to see in the industry? Yeah. So first and foremost, I would like to just thank um, our producers for committing to that. I think that it is so important. And what also making sure that it's a paid internship program. We're not just you know creating an internship program where we invite people of color in to you know follow us for free, but they're going to be following us in every single uh, side of. Uh, of our production. So um, with stagehands, with the actors, with Marianne, um, and I'm really, really excited to uh, be a part of a production that is enforcing this program. I think it is so important because we just need to make sure that people feel invited in to our community. I think more than anything mm -hmm. is that in every, every aspect of our community, they feel like they have a, a, a right to be here and a way in. And that needs to change, um, yeah. is the access, um, is the training. Oh, you know, IATSE, I think, has like a three-year internship program. And most people, you know, are related and have family members. Like every side of our, our business has a very, very difficult way in. And that needs to change. And I'm really excited uh, to help be a part, like to start start that and help it in some way. My my other thing that I really want to see change is accessibility in terms of tickets. And I think the only way that that will change is we need more, you know, so lots of, lots of things have to happen in our government, but we need more government funding for theater so that theater can be more affordable so that it's not this just commercial beast that is expensive to run and drives ticket prices way up. We need to have more people come into our theater houses that aren't just, you know, the wealthy elite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it has to be more accessible. Yes, I think um, I think a lot of the way our industry works needs to be examined and and frankly dismantled. Yeah. Um, I I think that this pandemic has proved that the business model we have does not work. It doesn't. It does not hold up. Um, we actors are about to many of us, most of us are about to lose our health insurance. And um, we've just, it's just uh, been announced that it's harder now for us to get health insurance. Um, and, and that's, that's one aspect of our industry in terms of the diversity, what I love that company is doing, and I hope that other shows and all aspects of our industry follow is um, visibility not only on stage, but on in on all sides behind Absolutely. the table, especially on the producerial side. Yes. We need more theater makers of color and we need more, you know, not just the actors. We need plenty of more actors on stage of, of, of color and of all backgrounds, but we really need people on the other side of the table as well. The people who like make quote the big decisions mm -hmm. about who gets cast about what kind of stories are told. And that's a big thing for me. It's, it's to me, we need to diversify our storytelling. Mm -hmm. It's not just it's not just diversifying the cast and the people on stage. It's what kind of stories are we choosing to tell, especially right now, mm -hmm. um, in a post COVID and post George Floyd world. Yeah. Uh, we need we need more visibility um, everywhere. Um, also, I think that the uh, the industry needs to understand that the artists, especially in New York, are decidedly middle class. Mm -hmm. You know, we, a lot of the world sort of sees us because they see like red carpets and opening night parties and things like that. They think that we are sort of living in the glamour of it and we get to bask in the applause. Yeah. Um, 
what if they we're, if we're committing to theater, you guys, I promise you, we've committed to a, at best, middle class life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like, truly. Really. And it's because we love it. And, but that is something that fascinates me as well about um, f fans sometimes. Like, I, I, this nice view behind me, it's a studio. I'm in a small, very small space, <laughs> you know, like I, and that's like, you know, we, this is what we're committing to. It's because we love the craft so, so, so much. Yeah. Um, but that, that is a very true statement. <laughs> and I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of discussions on race and there needs to be a lot of discussions on class as well. And about, um, you know, our, our industry, as far as, uh, like rents of the theaters go, what, where are these costs going? How much do things cost? You know, I've seen a lot of theaters that that say that, you know, we're poor, we have no budget, we have nothing, but I've seen millions of dollars go into refurbishing a lobby. And mm -hmm. then the actors are making less than minimum wage at the end of the day, you know? Um, thank God for fair wage on stage that helped change some of those practices, but those practices yeah. need to be dismantled and we need to, call them out, I think. And we need to be a little louder about calling them out um, if we want to see change happen on all levels of, of our industry. It's a long road. Here it we is go. a long road, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's what I keep thinking is like, I'm here and I'm doing it and I'm ready to be on the other side, yes. ready to go and helping these changes, You know, make sure that these changes happen. And, but and it part is a of, long road. Yes, and part of, <clears> I think, 2020 and the, this this tumultuous year and this tumultuous political year has has you know empowered us to speak up and mm -hmm. has empowered us. I've never been more active um, politically than I have this year. Oh God, I've, and, I, I know. <laughs> and yeah. starting to understand where your voice really can make a difference, and um, I think we can apply that to our industry to uh, to fight for our fellow artists, especially fellow artists of color mm. and of of various gender identities and for those people who don't get a fair shot. Absolutely. <sighs> Yay. <laughs> yeah. Early on during the shutdown, company cast members were having virtual meetups. Are those still happening? They are less frequently, <laughs> but they are. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, we, the last we, one, yeah. The last sorry. one we did was writing, was writing, um, uh, letters to voters to, you know, to uh, encourage them to vote. Um, yes. Totally nonpartisan, just a letter writing campaign. Oh, yeah, we this all did not together like, as a company. are you voting blue? Um, this was just to reach out to any and all voters. I had several Republicans on mine and, you know, just you send a letter, just making sure that people are voting, people are engaged in this election. And that was really wonderful. I was so glad that we did that as a company. But we are, we're meeting once a month. It's all, you, uh, you know, all the props in the world to our fearless, unbelievable leader, Katrina Lank, who makes sure that we put these together every month. I love you, Katrina. I need to you, reach out to Katrina. I've been like box. This is my month where I think I've just shut down a little bit and been like, yeah. hey, talk to me. Um, and I need to send her like a letter of love because she's just been so incredible and made sure that we stay connected. And yeah. we were meeting once a week at first mm -hmm. and then it became like two weeks and now it's once a month. And I think we can keep the once a month thing going. Um, but there was a moment there where it was like, I don't have anything new to say. <laughs> I've got nothing new this week. <laughs> yeah. I, well, it's so funny to think about our first Zoom meetings when we were meeting once a week and yeah. running through the script because we thought yeah. we would be back in a few months. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think it was Patty who was like, what are we doing? Why, <laughs> why are we doing this? And we were all like, fair, that's fair. That's fair, Patty. <laughs> well, and then Patty... Uh, if you want more Patty Lapone stories, she's the one who like started the company like dance party. I know. When we used to Zoom, she used to play funky Broadway ain't funky no more. That was, we would... <laughs> she was like, why are we reading through the script? Let's drink and dance for the love of God. Yeah. And we were like, thank you. That sounds great. From her infamous basement. Yes. Oh, <laughs> I miss her. Me too. What do you miss most about doing the show? Oh my God. I miss, <laughs> I miss a tie. I miss a tie and I miss uh, the company. You yeah. know, I obviously I love the material and the character and everything about it was a dream come true. But um, from Marianne and Chris down, 
I miss the company so much. Even our stage management, you guys, this was the best stage management team I've ever, ever had to be around them. There was joy in every single corner of our theater. I'm going to get emotional talking about it. I miss it so much. Um, They, this group of people, I've never, I've never known so much heart and I've never, ever been in a room where the chemistry was that immediate and that caring and that respectful. Um, it was the safest space I've ever worked in. And I I can't wait. I can't wait to get back to to seeing all of you and hugging you again and uh and and working with you and just learning from you all. That was yeah. the thing that was so remarkable about this group is that every single day I learned something profound. Profound about comedy, about about caring for one another, about how to listen on stage. If you want to learn how to listen on stage, watch Patti Lapone for one minute and you, you learn volumes. I mean, master, master class every night. I miss it so much. Yeah, I miss, um, I miss our scene a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's um, I think just one of the most beautiful scenes in the show. Yeah, clearly I'm biased, but it's just the writing, the writing. But every time I've seen Company, I felt that way is... Yeah. the journey that that scene takes and that we get to go on it together. Um, I miss that a lot. I miss, this is a very tiny little moment, but I've never done this in a show before where I actually get to enter, you know, through the audience in mm-hmm. this show. And it's right at the beginning. And just those, the few previews we did, that feeling of walking through the audience and feeling that anticipation and feeling how excited they were really you know, right next to me, there's the audience just- You walked by Steve in the first preview too, right? Yeah, yes. It's crazy. <laughs> and and that that feeling I miss, and um, I don't know, I just, and not to get too, too emotional, but um, you know, the, my, my dad passed away during this uh, time in April, um, and this was the last show he got to see me do. And um, my last, you know, memory was the, our first preview of Company with him there. And he got to go to the party afterwards and, um, you know, party with Sondheim and with all of us. And and uh, I guess that's not really answering the question, but I nope. can't I can't help but connect the experience of doing the show with my with your father, father. <laughs> and um, and remembering the, you know, the joy and the pride that that he felt and that I felt that he was there and and um yeah I guess I just I miss him (laughs) and I miss I I miss I miss it all I miss I miss our our world before this yeah um I think something that needs to be said about a tie Amy is obviously this character that is so memorable I mean the 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 scene the breakdown the song the the best Amy's I've ever seen are supported by amazing, amazing Pauls. And what Atai does with Paul is something so special, so present, so loving, and elevates the scene beyond, I think, I've ever seen it done. And it's just like, it was so special to share it with him every night because I, it's very hard to do a, 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 a a piece like that where you know everyone is dissecting it in the audience in a way that they don't normally, you know, they know the words, they know the words to the scene. They're waiting for the yeah. punchlines, you know? Yeah. It's a very nerve wracking thing, especially in the first few shows. Um, but to have a tie there who I could just drop into, I it was just like, you you saved me. I mean, seriously, it was just, I, I'm so grateful. Um, so yeah, and I miss Marianne, I have to say that. Oh I, my miss, God. I miss Marianne too. Oh I really miss her. Last question. With theaters in a state of flux, what are your hopes for its future? Well, I mean, I think we've talked about a lot of it, but, you know, I said it 
I've, I've been saying this a lot publicly lately. My, my goal at this point, because we have no idea what's going to happen. We just don't, we don't know when, um, yeah. ideally I'm still like hanging on to uh, fall of next year. I think that's a really great realistic thing to look at, especially if we get a vaccine in the beginning of the year. Um, we'll obviously start with social distancing and we'll start with probably even like temperature ta taking at the door. Oh, yeah. Even, even rapid testing, um, yeah. we might be able to achieve that. Yeah. So there's a lot of positives in, I think, us still coming back in 2021. And I'm still really not just hopeful, but like feel good about it. I know that uh, our governor is actually now focusing on how to bring us back and uh, talking to theater owners and talking to producers and knows that New York is, is going to not survive without Broadway. So like we need Broadway. And that's why I'm very confident that it will be a focus next year. All that being said, um, my, my biggest thing, I, whenever it is, I'm here, however long it takes, I'm here. I will be on the other side of this, whatever that means. And I, you know, no matter how painful it is at first, if people aren't running back to theaters immediately, I, I am here. I theater has to come back. And I've been so inspired during this time because I'm teaching a lot during this time and I'm, I'm doing master classes with kids. And in their world, theater's gonna be there on the other side of this. There's, they're, you know, they're still going to school. They're still, they're still talking about theater in a way that they, they're, they're just passionate about it and they want to be involved in it. And that like gives me so much faith every single time I get off those calls and I'm like, oh, people love theater. People love theater and they want it and they need it. And I I just can't wait, no matter when it is, to be involved in theater coming back. Yes, yes. And you covered this before, but my, my biggest hope is access. Um, yes. And I talked a lot about access within the industry, but, but you also mentioned audience access. I think mm -hmm. that that needs to be a number one priority Absolutely. coming back. I think um, I think we are all realizing that uh, theater is very important. Yeah. Um, I think most people realized it when they tuned into Hamilton on Disney Plus. Yeah. Um, that you know <laughs> that what what we do does matter, and yeah. it matters economically and it matters culturally. Um, and especially you know for us for Broadway musical theater is is an American contribution to culture. Yes. And. Um, we need to keep it alive, but it needs to evolve. And our old ways of thinking and our old ways of theater making need to evolve mm -hmm. on, at the highest level. Mm -hmm. And I think that starts with access. That yep. starts with, with opening up the theater to people that we, uh, we wouldn't normally think of as theater goers who are hungry for it. Yes. Um, Allowing and there's, a whole, there's a whole world of audiences who theater could affect and and enrich and, and enrich their lives yeah. that we just have ignored. And um, it's time to change that. And I'm excited to see uh, where we go as long as we stay vigilant and we stay loud. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I can't wait. And I'll be there with you. <laughs> yes. We'll be getting, you know, getting married. Getting eight married times a again. Week. Yeah, just a little bit older. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, guys. Thank, thank you, you so for tuning much. In. I am so grateful for this. Just to, I don't know, have this conversation with you too, Atai. I miss you so much. I miss you too. This is such a treat. Yeah, I know. I love you so much. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. And uh, make sure that you are on the other side of this as well, supporting theater. We need you when we come back. And uh, we'll be there with, waiting for you guys. Be safe and take care of yourself too. Yeah, please. Mwah. <laughs>